Okay, now that I've connected my Google Scholar with the Toro University of California library system, I want to begin searching. So let's use an example from one of the sample theses that were in session one, or at least the topic of that. So I'm going to search here now for, as an example, autism and lag schedule. And just by typing it in that way, I'm going to see what we get. So as you can see, the first thing you'll notice is I'm getting my full text at TUC Library over here. And I want to show you a couple of things about the way in which Google Scholar provides information to the user. So when I get these items, you'll see that it bolds the words that I had in my search. So you can see where those words appeared and whether or not they were, say, in the title compared to part of the text. Or in this case, you can see this one here is as part of the journal entry that's there. So you get a sense as to how prominent these things are because obviously if all three of my terms were in the title or in the abstract, that likely indicates a greater importance of those topics to the overall piece of literature than what it would be if it was just randomly placed throughout. The other thing I can do is, you know, leg schedule is a phrase. So you can see it appears together here, together here, together here. It doesn't appear together here, but lag reinforcement schedule is still what I'm looking for. So it gives me a sense because when I just search these three words here, it basically just searches them individually. So it's looking for an article that has the word autism in it somewhere. It has the word lag in it somewhere and it has the word schedule in it somewhere. It doesn't necessarily need to have any of those things next to each other. So once you've got that, so looking at the actual entries that we get here, the first thing I want to point out is when you come to one of these entries, if you were to just click on the title, it will take you to what it thinks is the official version of it. And in most cases, that's the journal version. So you can see here, the main item is coming from Wiley Online Library. So if I click here, it's probably going to take me to, yep, Online Library from Wiley. So, you know, that's one of the ways in which you can get it. But you'll notice all of these references also have all X number of versions, or most of them do, I should say. All the ones I've got right here do. Sometimes they won't, but in most cases you'll find if there's multiple versions, they'll have it. So if you were to click on all 14 versions, you can see all of the other places where this is kept. And in some cases, they are institutional uh, places. So my guess is because that's a umn.edu, that's probably the University of Minnesota, I'm going to guess, which means I'm guessing one of these three authors are from the University of Minnesota and they've posted a copy of this article on their institutional website, or maybe this particular journal is hosted at the University of Minnesota, and that's why it's over there. Similarly, this one here says ResearchGate. ResearchGate is a uh, self-archiving site that authors can join, and once they join it, they have the ability to post their own research there, and you can see by the looks of it, one of these authors has posted it on their own personal research gate site. So you can see the, the PDF of it here. Um, one of the nice things about using the all version is oftentimes if the main site doesn't have a full text, sometimes some of the alternate sites will. So as an example, this research gate site has a PDF available. As I scroll down, you'll see this one here. Um, this uh, Semantic Scholar website also has a PDF available. So by using that all X number of versions that you see here, oftentimes if the article isn't available for free from the main source or from the official source, you might be able to get it from this particular version, you know, from another source or another website here, and you'd be able to find it that way. Now, in our case, obviously, we can also get them from the TUC Library database by clicking on that link. 
So in addition to the all X number version here, there are a couple of other useful things that you have here. Uh, one is you'll see this star that's here. And by clicking on that star, essentially you're adding it to your library. And for those of you that are using EndNote or something like that, one of the nice things is, is that um, once you have a collection of items, so let's put the first, the third, and the fourth one here into my library. If I were to come over here on the right side and click on my library, here are the three of them here. And I do have the ability, you can see, of exporting them. And I could export them in a format that EndNote would allow me to bring them in. So it gives me essentially the option of incorporating this into my EndNote library. Another thing that you've got here is usually each one of them will have this quotation mark here. And if you're looking at the all versions, in most cases, it's just the first one that will have it. What that essentially does is it gives you the MLA, APA, Chicago, Harvard, and Vancouver citation formats. It'll also give you a way to download it into these different citation managers, including EndNote. So essentially, it'll pull down the citation for you. Now, I will be honest and say that these are largely based upon user input, meaning whoever added the um, particular piece of literature to the web first, that's the one that Google would have figured out is the citation. And in some cases, they get it correct. So I'm looking at the APA citation here. That is actually a correctly formatted citation. But I will be honest with you and say that the vast majority, when I say the vast majority, I do mean like 9 out of every 10, there will be something wrong with the way the citation is written. So this is one of the reasons why regardless if you're using this feature, regardless if you're using EndNote, you want to make sure that you understand the basic principles of APA to allow you to be able to spot when things are wrong. So I can look at that very quickly and there's a couple of things I'm looking for that I think are common mistakes that I often find on these and I don't see them. Um, so I can tell right away that it's a good citation. So that's a useful little feature. Next to the quotation marks you'll see cited by and then there's a number. And this is actually a really useful feature because say as an example, this particular article here, this effects of lag schedules and preferred materials on variable responding in students with autism. Say this was a really useful article. I pulled it down, I reviewed it, and it's got some really great ideas in there. One of the nice things is I can actually, you know, this is an article that's 14 years old. So if I found it useful, chances are that other people who cited this article in their own work also found it useful. And there's a high percentage opportunity that I would find their work useful as well. So by clicking on the cited by option, it's going to give me the 97 articles that cited that particular journal article that I found really useful. So now I've got, you know, these 97 results here that are ones that also used that article. So it essentially allows me, it gives me a web, if you will, of other related articles that I can look through and see if there's any use or value to these here. And if there's a lot of them, 97 is not a lot. It's only five pages of results. I could probably scan through them easily. But say, for example, if the article that I had was cited maybe 500 times or 5,000 times. I don't really want to be clicking through all of those pages. What I can do is I could specifically search just within these 97 articles. So if I click on this little box here where it says search within the citing articles, and now if I were to search up here, say I want something that's specifically in the school environment. So I want to search the word school here. By clicking on this box, it's going to search these 97 results just for the word school. So now I've knocked it down to 67 results. So 67 of the original 97 had the word school in it. Say maybe I want to focus up on primary. Let's see if I can find the word primary in there. 
So now if I search on that, now it knocks it down to 46. So now I've been able to take my search results where I found something that was particularly useful to me when I searched autism and leg schedule. And that was this first article here, the effects of leg schedules and preferred materials on variable responding in students with autism. I was able to take 97 results or 97 articles that had cited this particular one. And by searching within just those 97 articles, I've been able to identify 46 of them here now that include the words school and primary in them. Now, as you can see from looking through, some of these aren't going to be useful to me. Like this third one here, the word primary shows up, not in terms of primary school, but in terms of primary colors. This fourth one has the word primary methodology in it. So that's, again, maybe not what I'm looking for, but I only have 46 of these I've got to check out to see if they have a primary school person in there. So, you know, that makes it a lot easier and it makes my searching that much more specific in terms of what it is I'm looking for. Um, two other things I want to show you, and the first, again, coming across the bottom, next to the cited by, and then you'll see the number, is also related articles. So each of these articles would have had certain keywords associated with them that either the author, or in some cases the journal themselves, may have provided um, to when they were submitting the article and when it was being published. So what Google Scholar will do is it will take those keywords and it will do a search for you base and find articles that have the same types of keywords. So again, if this particular article was really interesting to me, was really uh, up, the, uh, you know, up my alley in terms of what it was I was interested in, by clicking on related articles, now I've got another 101 articles here that are, have the same keywords as what this original article that I was interested in have. So, and as you can see, just by looking at the titles, you know, leg schedules, leg schedule. Um, I don't see it in the, the title of that one, but this one has leg schedule in the title. So you can see that it's pulling up useful articles. It's pulling up related articles. The final thing I'm going to mention about Google Scholar and how it's set up, you'll notice in this green line here, where it begins with the authors and some of the authors you'll see have are underlined while others aren't. The ones that are underlined are individuals that have actually gone ahead and created their own Google Scholar profile and they've made that profile public. So I can look at this and you can see this guy R. Lee has two articles right the first two that I got when I just searched autism leg schedule. Um, so, and, and those were the first two that popped. So, you know, chances are he's the only, by the looks of it, he or she is the only person I can see on this front page so far that has, oh, there's a third one, um, that has written more than a single article on the topic. So chances are this individual is someone who writes a lot about this particular topic. And there may be other things that he's written that aren't showing up for me here that are of interest to me. Because he or she has made their scholar profile public, I can click on their name and it actually takes me to, in this case, his profile. So he's a professor in demography and economics at the University of California at Berkeley. It actually provides me a link to his homepage here. And as you can see, it goes through and lists off all of the other articles that Google Scholar has found him publishing. And by the looks of it, most of them don't appear to be in my area of interest. So this is probably actually a very bad example in terms of trying to find one where I find somebody that actually has um, things that are specifically of interest to me. And it's possible that when Google created this profile, if he wasn't careful when he actually put together his profile, he may have had things pulled in that weren't necessarily his. Because looking at, you know, he's in demography and economics, and when I look at the topics that he's put there, they aren't consistent with the things that I'm interested in. So maybe it's not the same R. Lee that um, I found a second ago, and that's possible. 
Google, this is one of the limitations of Google is that it doesn't always bring these things together. But let's try another one. Actually, there's two articles here that have been written by this P. Sturmey. So let's look at P. Sturmey here. And this one apparently is going to be more on my line because he works at the Graduate Center and Queens College at City University of New York. Um, and you can see the topics that he's used to describe himself are behavioral analysis, autism, and intellectual disabilities. So those are probably much closer to my area. So now I can go through and look at other things that he has written that may be specific to my area of interest. So and I can scroll down here and it provides a lot of useful information even on this because again say and I don't know uh, let me see if I can find one that has lag in it. so say this particular one here actually that looks to be one of the ones that we found a minute ago but it was cited by 97 that's our original one our 97 people so I can go back and find you know who are the 97 people that cited this individual again so if there was something else here that was of particular interest that I didn't find earlier I can go and see the other people that have cited that particular article. The other thing that I can do when I'm in Google Scholar is I can set up alerts. So by creating alerts, what it will do is it will actually go through and it will generate what it thinks is my query. And in this case, it thinks my query is autism. And you'll notice it put lag schedule in, or in quotes. And it will email me when this when essentially it finds things that meet that particular criteria and I can have it show up to 10 results or up to 20 results and then I can create an alert so that it will essentially email me every time it finds something new based upon that specific criteria that I've got there so that's basically how to set up and search through Google Scholar to find things and to use all of the functionality that Google Scholar has available to you as you begin searching through the literature.